Well, thank you for joining us today. It is a, a wonderful day to be alive. It's a good day to be a Christian. And uh, we don't really have all that many announcements uh, today, but I just want to remind you uh, to continue to be faithful uh, to the Lord uh, during this time with your Bible reading and your prayer. And uh, I'm just looking forward to being able to worship together again uh, as a collective church body. But until then, uh, we're going to continue to try to meet the spiritual needs of our people and those who listen to our messages uh, just however we can. So we just thank you for joining us today, and uh, we're going to hear uh, some singing, and we'll hear some special piano music today, but thank you for joining us uh, this morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Please join me in singing, In My Heart There Rings a Melody. I have a song that Jesus gave me. It was sent Every day and 
Thank you for joining us uh, today. We ask you to take your Bibles and turn to Joshua chapter number 24 today. Joshua chapter number 24. I have some visitors with us today. Uh, they are sitting on the very first cup of pews, and I'm sure you'll get to see them uh, maybe just a little bit later, but uh, someone had uh, come to visit us today at Grace Baptist Church. But Joshua chapter number 24 is where we're going to be. Uh, Joshua 24, the last chapter uh, of Joshua, it's a very exciting times for the people of Israel. Uh, they had defeated their enemies, they have claimed the promised land, each tribe has received their inheritance, and now is beginning to settle down and enjoy life just for a little bit. It was a time of hope, it was a time of prosperity, it was a time of blessing. And it also, I think sometimes in uh, situations like that, it could be a very dangerous time as well. Uh, there, is, there is danger that they would forget where they came from. There is a danger that they had gotten, that they had gotten to where they were and that everything the Lord had done in their lives, there's a possibility of them forgetting all those different things. There is a danger that they would possibly turn to idolatry following the religious traditions of the Canaanites who still lived in that area, there is a danger that they would fall into a state of complacency, a, a state of just everything is normal, everything is fine, and they don't really have to do anything else besides just exist. A state in which they might feel that they could let down their guard a little bit. These were indeed a wonderful time for the children of Israel, However, it was also a very dangerous time. And in the midst of this situation, at the final uh, chapters of the book of Joshua, he stands up and he delivers a challenge to the people. It's a challenge from the Lord. And the challenge is simple. Joshua is challenging his people, God's people, to dedicate themselves to God and to his work. He was trying to get them to dedicate themselves. He does not want them to just try living uh, on their own or living without him. But his desire was to have them continue in that relationship and trusting in God. He did not want a half-hearted dedication. It's simply put, he wanted a complete, wholehearted dedication or nothing. And that is the, the message, that is the, the message in the passage that we will see this morning. And can I remind you this morning that we too are living in a very dangerous time. We as believers here in 2020, we, we had, from Grace Baptist Church, we're, we're living in, I believe, some, of course, uncharted waters, uncharted uh, areas of our lives, but it also could be a very serious and a very dangerous time in our lives. Folks, we've been out of church for seven weeks, counting today. We have been practicing social distancing, trying to stay six feet away from each other, uh, trying to distance ourselves from, uh, from the virus. And I wonder sometimes, what is it going to be like when we're able to meet again? Are, are we going to be closer to the Lord? Or are we going to be farther away from the Lord? You know, we've been practicing this social distancing from each other. But I'm afraid sometimes, I'm fearful, although I pray that we are able to continue to stay close to the Lord. But have we distanced ourselves from Him? Have we distanced ourselves away from him? We've had very little opportunity or no opportunity to fellowship together. We've had no opportunity to 
uh, serve the Lord together. Some people are enjoying this virtual church. They're able to get up at whatever time they want and turn on the TV, get in their lazy boy chair, plop their feet up, and turn on the YouTube app. And boy, you know what? They can get used to that. Uh, we all could get used to that, having a virtual church. But Christ created and ordained and instituted the local church. A, a church that we are able to gather together to encourage one another, to exhort one another, to serve one another. And I think sometimes at this crisis that when we began in March, that once we come out of that, we're going to have to redo church. I wonder what our church people are going to be like. Are they going to be closer to the Lord? Are they going to be farther away from the Lord? But in the midst of all this, in the midst of this crisis, in the midst of the coronavirus, amidst of the unknown, there is one constant. There is one, one thing that we can hold to and we could, as a believer, we can hold on to. And that is this, that our God never changes. The same God that was on the throne in March is going to be the same God that when we come out of this coronavirus pandemic. We need to realize that he is still in control, that we can still trust him, that, that his word is still truth in our lives, that his presence is with us, his power is still unlimited, and folks, realize this, amongst all these other things, his plan is still perfect. So as the world finds this all in turmoil and worry and fret and concern, let us know today that we have a God who is steadfast. And we ought to trust in his steadfastness. And just as the Lord issued a call through Joshua for those individuals centuries ago, his people today, we are still have that same question. We still have that, that same question. Are we going to continue to serve the Lord? Today I'd like to preach a message simply entitled, Time to Choose. It's a time to choose. You know, we, we go through life making choices every day. We, we make a choice of whether or not we're going to wake up in the morning. We make a choice of whether it's going to be Fruit Loops or Cocoa Puffs. We make a decision whether it's going to be McDonald's or Dunkin' Donuts or Krispy Kreme or Crumpies. And isn't it interesting how all my choices when I start out in the morning have relation to food. I'm not sure if that's a sign or not. But we make all these different decisions. We all have a choice of what we're going to do with our lives. And today you have the opportunity to decide who you're going to worship. Who, who are you going to honor? Who are you going to love? Who are you going to be obedient to? We can be obedient to the God of this world, the devil. Or we could choose to work for and to serve and to honor the Lord Jehovah, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And I'd like to see three things today. The first area in which I'd like to look at is it's a time of deliberation. A Joshua chapter 24, beginning in verse number 1. And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads, and for their judges and for their officers, and they presented themselves before God. 
And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nacor, and, and they served other gods. And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood, and led him throughout all the land of Canaan, and multiplied his seed and gave him Isaac. And I gave unto Isaac Jacob and Esau, and I gave unto Esau the Mount Seir to possess it. And Jacob and his children went down into Egypt. I sent Moses also and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt according to that which I did among them, and afterward I brought you out. And I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and ye came unto the sea, and the Egyptians pursued after your fathers, and chariots and horsemen unto the Red Sea. And when they cried unto the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians, and brought the sea upon them, and covered them, and your eyes have seen what I have done in Egypt, and ye dwelt in the wilderness a long season." Verse number 8 says, And I brought you into the land of the Amorites, which dwelt on the other side of Jordan. And they fought with you, and I gave them into your hand, that ye might possess their land, and I destroyed them before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and warred against Israel. And I sent and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not hearken unto Balaam. Therefore he blessed you still, so I delivered you out of his hand. And he went over Jordan and came unto Jericho, and the men of Jericho fought against you. The Amorites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and there are a lot of ites there. And it says, and I delivered them into your hand. And verse 12, I sent a hornet before you which drave them out and before you, even the two kings of the Amorites, but not with thy sword nor with thy bow. And I, gave, and I have given you a land for which ye did not labor, and cities which ye built not, and ye dwell in them, and the vineyards and the olive, olive yards which ye, have plant, which ye planted, not do ye eat. There is a time, number one, of deliberation. Years ago, when I was probably about 24 or 25, I was uh, at home and I got a summons to uh, be on jury duty. And you know what? The first thing that comes to a man's mind is when they get a jury duty notice is that, okay, how can I get out of it? The last thing I wanted to do is spend three or four days on jury duty trying to decide whether a person is guilty or a person is innocent. Whether I have to pay this person or the, or the jury is going to award this amount of money, I really did not care to be a part of this jury. So I went there with the whole, the whole spirit, the whole attitude of, of saying, how can I get out of this? And I remember as they were asking the questions, and I answered them honestly. And pretty soon they got my name called, and I went to one other pool, and they put me over on this side over here, and I thought, oh, no. I was watching people dismiss from the courtroom left and right, and all of a sudden now I get put over here. Uh-oh, I'm going to have to be put on this jury. And sure enough, I was on a jury. I wasn't the jury foreman, praise the Lord, but I was on the jury. And for two days I had to sit and listen to facts about a, a malpractice suit. Whether the doctor, this ophthalmologist, was, was guilty of, or, of neglect, which caused this girl to be blind in one of her eyes. And as we sat there and we listened to all the facts, we listened to the history of the very first appointment, to uh, the, the next appointment, and we listened and went through all the, the different steps, we had all the facts before the jury. And then all of a sudden, they sent us to the jury room to deliberate, to find out all the facts and determine and render a judgment based upon the facts that were given to us. And here in these first 13 verses, I see Joshua giving some remarks about everything that God has done in their lives. 
And he says in verse number 13, And I have given you a land for which ye did not labor, cities which ye built not, and ye dwell in them. Of the vineyards and olive yards which ye planted not, do ye eat. And he stops right there and he goes into another section of the passage. But I see number, number one, there is a time of deliberation. He wants the children of Israel to remember who they are, where they came from, and what the Lord has done for them. And my friends, how, how nice it would be, how good it would be for us to think back of everything that God has done in our lives since the time of our salvation and, and think about all the answers to prayer that he has given to us and to deliberate on his goodness. And I see, number one, to deliberate on God's power in their life. In verses 1 through 12, he reminded them. And Joshua reminded the children of Israel about God's choice and the call of Israel. How he redeemed them and delivered them out of Egypt. How he manifested his power and his glory on their behalf time and time again. They were reminded of the great victories that they enjoyed. Against the Amorites. Against Balak, the king of Moab, upon Jericho. And then upon the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and all the other ites, all the different victories that they had. He wanted them to remember how God had seen them through all these difficult times. And that the blessings that they had received because they did it the God's way. They did it his way. And maybe we need to do some deliberation in our lives. Maybe we need to think back of how God had worked in our lives and remember where he found you and where he found me and what he has done for you and how he has blessed you and how he has worked on your behalf time and time again, how he answered prayers in our lives. And remember the power that we have through the Holy Spirit of God in our lives, the power to, 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 to continue on. We need to, number one, deliberate the power, God's power in our lives. We also need to deliberate God's presence in, their, in our lives. Israel was reminded that no matter where he, they went, God was there following and with them in everything they faced. He, had, he was there to help them and to see them through. And we're reminded of Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. We need to remember that everywhere, everything that we as believers go through, that no matter where we go, he is going to be with us. His presence is with us. The very Holy Spirit of God that indwelt us uh, at the time of our salvation, he continues to dwell with us. And maybe we need to deliberate just a little bit on God's presence in our lives. I'm not sure how many times I've, I've heard this story before or a form of this story of church members that when they are going through a difficult time and they're, they're walking with the Lord and they just say they, they go through the trial, they go through that valley and they reach the other side and they would say this, Pastor, I just sense God's presence with me. He is the one who, who strengthened me, who encouraged me, who, who brought me through this difficult time. And that is what Joshua was trying to relay to the children of Israel. Hey, hey, deliberate, contemplate, think about God's presence in your lives. Think about how God's power is in your lives, but also God's provision in their lives. God had provided for them. A number of weeks ago, we looked at how the manna, how it appeared uh, in the mornings, and they had just enough to, to make it through the day. And how God provided for them there. But here in verse number 13, it says that they, they, they had a land that they did not labor for, a cities that they did not build, vineyards that they ate of but they did not work, and that there is just a, another 
illustration of how God provides for his children, how he provided for the children of Israel. They did not have to work for it, but God provided it there for them. And God does the same for us today. My friends, we are clearly partakers of God's grace and, and we have grace each and every day of our lives and how God provides for us. I think we can all probably think back of some time in our lives in which God provided things for you. Maybe not the, the wants that we, uh, are, are, that we want, but he always takes care of the needs. He's never been late with one need that we have. We may say, well, I had this bill that needed to be paid and and God did not provide it in the right amount of time, but in God's perfect timing, he answers that prayer. It may not be the way that we want it to be answered, but he does and he's never late and he provides for us. But number two this morning, we see a time of deliberation but also a time of confrontation. And verses 14 through 15 says these words, Now therefore, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day, whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whom land ye dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He gives them a choice. He says there's a time of confrontation. We're commanded, they're, they're commanded to fear God. It's that word fear, curiosity, to clean up their lives by putting away the, the false gods in their lives that they were, they were serving the, at that time. But he was confronted by a command. He says, fear the Lord. My friends, that is simply to say that we need to reverence and honor him for who he is. He deserves to be respected He deserves to be loved by those who he has redeemed. And if you're listening this morning or listening today, and you are redeemed of the Lord, that same command is for us to fear him, to trust him, to revere him, to honor him. He then gives them another command. It's interesting that these these words, fear the Lord and to put away other gods and to serve the Lord with sincerity are all in the imperative tense. They're, they're, in their commands, they're, they're orders. And he says, fear the Lord. Then he says, put away our other gods. Those are things that take the place of God in your lives. Some things that, that, that have your attention. Some things that, 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 that you're, 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 you're holding on to. And he's saying, put them away, get rid of them. And then he says, serve the Lord with sincerity. That word serve carries the idea or means to fulfill the role of a slave. He, he wants us to serve him as a slave would serve his master. A slave would serve his master with 100% commitment and duty and dedication. And that's what he's referring to here. We need to serve the Lord wholeheartedly. We need to serve him completely with integrity. But also, there is not just the confronted with a command they were confronted with a choice. Joshua challenged his people to choose who they would serve. He gave them a choice to who to serve and to get to it. 
Hey, if you want to serve the God of the Amorites, then go do it. Hey, if you want to serve the God of Jehovah, go ahead and serve him. But make up your mind. There's a time for to make up a choice. And that same choice stands for us this morning. Are we going to serve the, the God of this world? Are we going to serve the Lord? Now, as a pastor, the answer that I am looking for from the church members of Grace Baptist Church is that, hey, you know what, pastor? We want to serve the Lord. And I would say that if every church member was here this morning, that they would say with their tongue, Pastor, we want to serve the Lord. But can I challenge you that sometimes what you say with your mouth is contradicting what you do with your life? We say one thing, but we do another thing. There's a choice. Grace Baptist Church, there's a choice that we have to make. We make it today for today. We make it tomorrow for tomorrow. We make it for Tuesday for Tuesday. Each and every day we have to make that choice of who we're going to serve. I think of Elijah. When he confronted them on Mount Carmel in 1 Kings chapter 18, Verse 21 says this, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt thee ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Now we all know the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel. There were the God, the, 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 the prophets of Baal against the prophet Elijah. And they had brought these, the bullocks, and they put them on two different altars. And, and Elijah said, go ahead, call upon your God. And, and, and they were calling and calling. They were cutting themselves. They were doing all these different things. And yet their God that they called upon did not answer their prayer. He's not, it wasn't real. But when he called for Jehovah, when Elijah called, it says in verse in, in, in chapter 18, verse 37, he says, Hear me, O Lord, hear that his, this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust, and looked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is the God. The, the Lord, he is the God. And they had a confrontation and they had a choice. And there they had that choice. They called upon him. But it never lasts very long. Sad to say, many who call upon the Lord in, in, in emotional states at times will make that decision, but all of a sudden they will fall away. But they were confronted by a choice, but they were also confronted by a challenge. Joshua had set the example. Uh, he laid down the gauntlet for the rest of his people there. By stating his intentions to serve the Lord. He says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And how important it is for God's men to make this commitment, to take this challenge and say, you know what? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'm sure there's a lot of mothers and wives who say, yes, as far as for me and for my house, we will serve the Lord, but we need men to step up to be their responsibilities, what God has put them to be. We need them to make that choice. Oh, how we need some Joshua's in our days. We need some men and women who will settle in their hearts that 
that Jesus Christ and, and his word and his will are going to come before anything else in their lives. Think about Daniel in Daniel chapter 1. I think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter 3. They made a choice. Daniel made a choice in Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 through 28. Ruth made a choice in Ruth chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. And lo, we need to make a, a challenge today. Does your life stand as a challenge to godly living? Or as an encouragement to godless living? It's either one or the other. Are you an example of godly living? Or are you an encouragement or an example of a godless life? It's time to choose. It's time to choose. There was a time of deliberation. There was a time of confrontation. But in verses 16 through 28, we see a time of dedication. Verse 16 says, And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord and serve other gods. For the Lord our God, he it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, and which did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way wherein we went. And among all the people who, uh, through whom we passed, and the Lord drave out from before us all the people, even the Amorites, which dwelt in the land. Therefore, we will also serve the Lord, for he is our God. And Joshua said unto his people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a ho an holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins if you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you after that he hath done you good. And the people said unto Joshua, Nay, but we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said unto the people, Ye are witnesses against yourselves, that ye have chosen you, the Lord, to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses now therefore put away, said he, the strange gods which are among you, and incline your heart unto the Lord God of Israel. And the people said unto Joshua, The Lord our God will we serve, and his voice will we obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and set them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God and took a great stone and set it up upon the, under the oak tree. And there was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said unto all his people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness unto us, for it hath heard all the words of the Lord which he spake unto us. It shall be therefore a witness unto you, lest ye deny your God. So Joshua let the people depart, every man unto his own inheritance. I see, my friends, a couple of principles here that we too can apply into our life. It's a time of dedication, a time of, of, of commitment. And I see, first of all, the resolve of God's people. The people considered all that God had done for them, and they declared their allegiance to him. They seem almost suspicious when, when offered the opportunity to serve other gods. Why would we want to serve the other gods when, when, when we see what God has done in our lives? Oh, how we as, 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 as believers today, as, as church members, as Christians, need to resolve of the people of God. We need to resolve that no matter what happens in our lives, we are going to dedicate, commit, consecrate our lives to him. In verses 19 through 23, I see the reminder to the people. Joshua took the opportunity to remind them that God is holy and that God is, is righteous. And if they serve him, he's, God will bless them. 
But if they don't, God was going to do them hurt. Or God was not going to bless them. I wrote down this in my notes. God's people need to remember that while God is a loving God, a God of grace, a God of mercy, he is also a God of holiness and righteousness. And he will not tolerate sin in the lives of his children. My friends, there is a high price to be paid for a disobedient child of God. You can turn to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 6 through, through 12, how God's chastening of the Lord. But I see lastly, in this time of dedication, we see the resolve of the people, the reminder to the people, but lastly, the reaction of the people. The people responded by setting out about the business of serving the Lord. They made that commitment. They made that dedication. And Joshua set up a memorial. He, he set up, as the Bible says here, a, a, a covenant. They made a covenant with the people that day. And set them a statute in the ordinance of Shechem. See, God records everything. You realize that, that God knows everything? That God writes down everything. God knows everything. God has a record of everything. And here the children of Israel, they, they, they made a vow unto the Lord. But they didn't keep it. We can go and you can read through Judges, Samuel, First and Second Kings, Chronicles. And we can see how they went back to idolatry. Maybe not all, but some. My friends, today we need to take, make a choice. It's time for us to choose. If the Lord be God, then serve him. Who are you going to choose? Who are you going to serve? One man wrote this down. It says, a Christian that refuses to live for the Lord is poor advertisement for the Lord Jesus Christ. While a life lived in his power and victory is a powerful advertisement for the Lord Jesus Christ. So my friends, the choice is up to you. Who are you going to serve? Let's pray. Father, Lord, we're thankful for the opportunity to be here together. And Lord, it's up to God's people to do with what the truth that has been given to them today. Will they choose to fear you? to put away the strange gods in their lives? Will they choose to serve you with all sincerity? Father, I would ask, Lord, this morning that you would continue to do a work in the hearts of your people. And I pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.